good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I'm still in there by a couple of minutes. Um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, this morning to talk to you a little bit about the environmental assessment processes that will parallel the marine planning um, that Philip has spoken about and, and will go forward, I suppose, in the new regime that's been put forward for the maritime area. Um, what I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about is um, initially how um, I see SEA strategic environmental assessment might be able to, uh, what it can do and also what it can't do in terms of assisting in the planning uh, framework um, that's being put forward. And then maybe just talk a little bit about uh, and align it with what Philip has just talked about there in terms of the marine uh, framework plan so that you can see what we're doing and how we're working with the department and ultimately the, the SEA and AA that's going to uh, to be published at the same time as the draft framework. I probably just preface this and say I'm really going to talk about SEA today, not AA. It's that's a whole other, um, a whole other conference at this point. There's so much to, to go through in it, um, and so many opinions on it. So we're going to just stick with the SEA this morning. So I think the starting position for me this morning is to talk about what it is and, and go back to that definition of what strategic environmental assessment is trying to do. And if you look at the, uh, the, the explanation on the screen at the minute, you'll see it's, um, there's a few bits to pick out there. It's a systematic process for evaluating, evaluating environmental consequences of plans and programs. It's done before the plan or program or framework in this case is adopted. And it is trying to ensure that environmental considerations are, are integrated into the plan. So if we just look at the, the three areas there in particular that I've highlighted, if we go to the before the plan is adopted, this is probably the key issue for SEA. Um, what you're trying to do is make sure that these environmental considerations and impacts are considered before a plan is, is taken on board, is adopted by government or whoever it might be, um, and then is launched out for industry to take up um, and then runs into issues at a later stage because environment hasn't really been considered properly. So that's what SEA is trying to do. It's trying to drag us right back up to the top of the chain and start thinking about environment early so that we have truly sustainable plans coming forward. Um, it talks about a systematic process for evaluating, so that's definitely pointing in the direction of environmental assessment. But there's probably a spectrum, and at the other end of the spectrum is this idea of integrating environmental considerations. So I would kind of explain it on the basis of the carrot and stick. So very much the environmental assessment would be taken up as the, the stick end of the, 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 the scheme where you're, you're using an environmental assessment to almost say yes or no to proposals. Whereas if at the other end, at the carrot end, you're trying to improve uh, the plan. So SEA can be used as a tool to genuinely improve how the plan is developed, how it's structured, the content of it, um, and how it can actually achieve the sustainability that we're all trying to achieve. Um, there's probably two camps of thought as to whether it should be all about the carrot or all about the stick. The reality is it's somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Um, and in, in, in reality, it's the nature of the plan that determines which end of the spectrum that you're, you're maybe uh, more focused on. So, if, for example, if you have um, a plan that's uh, got very high-level uh, policy statements, um, something like, you know, improve connectivity in a region, that really doesn't lend itself to very heavy environmental assessment because we really don't have enough information about how that connectivity might happen. So what we would do there is shift our SEA approach towards that more integrated uh, environmental assessment that allows us to ensure that the tools are in place for when the decisions are being made lower down in the hierarchy and um, that they're grounded in things like robust route and site selection that there are, there's robust feasibility, that there's signposts for where things can be um, improved upon later on in the planning hierarchy where detail appears. Um, if you've got something that's telling you we want a road built from X to Y and it has a line on a map, then we can shift our attention to something much more uh, traditionally em environmental assessment orientated where we can talk about whether it's in the right place, uh, etc. So it very much depends on the nature of the plan that we're working with. Um, I just probably wanted to talk for a minute or two about what SEA can really do and what it can't do. I, I've started with what it cannot do, so um, for the pessimistic approach to, to it, I suppose. But this is, I suppose, to manage expectations to a certain extent. Um, sometimes SEA 
the focus comes off the plan completely and everyone's looking at the SEA as being the saviour of all the problems, it's going to fix all the problems people have. And the reality is it can't. One SEA on one plan is not going to solve problems that maybe date back to historical planning decisions, that date back to political decisions, where there's legal limitations on what can and can't be done. We have to work in a reasonable framework. Um, so uh, it, 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 there, there needs to be a management of expectations about what an SEA can, can really achieve on one individual plan. Um, it can't dictate the scope of the plan. So if I'm doing a plan, if I'm handed a plan to assess and it's a, um, a roads need study, I can't really start talking about railways in that roads need study because that's not the scope of the plan. So I have to work within the scope of the plan. We can't ignore the legal limitations for either the plan or the plan maker. So again, it may not be in the remit of the plan maker to stray outside. Um, and the SEA, while they can raise issues, can't, can't change that legal uh, framework that they have to work within. Um, it can't assess to a project level of detail either. The whole idea of SEA is that it's done at a plan and a strategic level. It's based on desktop analysis. It's looking at existing data sets. It can't get down into the nitty gritty of a, an EIA and it's not trying to. Um, so we're, we're trying to keep at the level of the plan. So in the context of the, uh, the marine planning framework, it will be quite a high level assessment because that's where the plan is. Um, the other thing to note is that it doesn't remove the need for further assessment later on. And this um, kind of neatly brings us on to what it can do. So um, one of the important things that SEA brings to the table is that it creates a framework in which we can have a cascade of environmental assessment. So we start at the top and it, as layers of detail appear through planning, we can then make a more detailed assessment. But the idea is that there are these tiers of planning all the way down. And the best example out there at the minute is around the national planning framework, which would have had the SEA and AA completed on it. But that's dropped down into the regional spatial and economic strategies, which are under, the, 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 um, some of them are completed and then the others are, are underway at the minute. Um, that will then drop down to the county development plan and the local area plan. And at each level of assessment, as more certainty comes into the, the planning side of it, we can uh, respond with a more detailed uh, strategic environmental assessment. So that's a really important thing that SCA can do and it can support that assessment all the way along. Um, it can signpost uh, where further assessment is needed. Um, that's an important thing as well. So at a very high level, like a framework, um, where all the answers aren't necessarily from an environmental perspective laid out. But what we can do with the SEA is signpost where they will be laid out or where they should be laid out. And that then gives decision makers the opportunity to build them in later on. Um, one of probably the most important things SEA can do, which I have found over the last 15 or so years of doing it, is that it can um, bring an element of education and awareness to plan makers. Um, often, the plans that we deal with, they, they are grounded to a degree in, in, in environmental um, positive undertones uh, from the point of view, for example, if you're looking at something like um, offshore wind, we obviously have the climate issue there, which is positive from the point of view of, of uh, offshore wind. But what the SEA can do is, is bring to the table the, the wider remit, if you like, for environment and start to lay out issues that maybe hadn't been on the table before, I suppose the unintended consequences of a, a relatively positive action, by, by having that space to talk, being at the table when strategic objectives are, are being formulated, we get the opportunity to raise awareness and, and, and educate the plan makers. Um, we can also, when we're at the table, um, make for more robust policies to be included in documents. So um, we can contribute to environmental protection policies, um, which, which ultimately, once they're in the plan, are essentially a plan maker's commitment to achieving the objective. So if we can actually get environmental protection objectives built into the plan, decision makers at a later stage can look back at that plan and say, well, there was a commitment to protect water quality. How are you actually achieving that? So it, it starts to be that feedback loop that if we say it, it might actually happen as we go forward and if we commit to it. And then finally, what it can do is um, it can provide that environmental assessment basis where we actually identify negative effects of some negative policies, maybe policies that are broadly good, but that we have to 
manage and think about the wider environment. And a good example of that would be something around tourism, where the policy itself, any policies around tourism are generally good. They're positive for material assets, they're positive for population. Um, they, they, they're addressing the issue of raising the profile of cultural heritage, built heritage. But we can't go ahead and just say tourism everywhere is great unless we also have a policy in there that says that we have to make sure we have uh, adequate services to address uh, the impacts of tourism. So if we are trying to encourage people in on a seasonal basis and there's a massive explosion of population in rural communities on a seasonal basis, but there's no wastewater capacity to deal with that influx, then that's going to lead to negative consequences for biodiversity, for water, for landscape, the whole remit. So we need to make sure we're building those protections in as well. And that's where the SEA can, can come to the fore. Um, I just wanted to, to, to flag people to people that the, it, it's not, I suppose, an, an, an empty space uh, SEA. Once the legislation came out of Europe in 2001 and was, was uh, transposed in 2004 in Ireland, there have been a number of effectiveness studies which the EPA has pushed through. Um, and I think that they're, they're an excellent uh, time for us to stop and reflect as a sector, um, an environmental sector, to see how we're doing. So the first one in Ireland, th th there's been corresponding ones by the Commission as well, but the first ones in Ireland dealt with, I suppose in 2011, were we actually engaging in SEA at all? And at that stage there were probably some sectors lagging behind. But when we've gone back and looked at it again now more recently, most sectors have act actually engaged and the focus has shifted in the latest effectiveness review into whether or not we're achieving good practices and, and, and how can we improve on the practices. But it's interesting that the areas that have flagged up as being um, wanting still a little bit are around alternatives, integration of mitigation and monitoring into plans and the transparency and decision making. So there are areas that we need to improve upon as we go forward. Um, I'm just for the last few minutes going to shift gear here and just talk a little bit about the National Marine Planning Framework and what we're doing in terms of SEA around that. This is just a graphic to show you how the processes align. Um, as I said, there is an AA process going on as well, but the SEA and AA are paralleling the, the, the development of the um, Marine Planning Framework. So we're feeding and there's a feedback loop in there um, for us to, to, to work with the department on. Um, and I would say that the department have been very open to the SEA from the start and they are open to environmental um, issues being brought forward. Uh, the SEA process, we've had a screening stage and a scoping stage. We're now very much firmly in the assessment stage so that we can um, deliver our environmental assessment documents uh, alongside the draft plan that Philip spoke about. Um, Philip's already spoken about this, so I won't really dwell on it. The, the area that's covered, the geographic and temporal scope of the plan is very broad. The scope that, of the activities that they're trying to uh, plan for is also very broad. Um, and that adds complications when you start to think about planning. And when you put another layer on top, which is what I have to do as an environmental uh, assessment approach, all of these areas then have to be taken into account in terms of how those policies that Philip has spoken about might be impacted positively or negatively in these receiving uh, um, topic areas. So the approach that we've broadly taken is one where we have uh, worked with the department on looking at alternatives, um, and I'll talk about them just uh, for in a minute. Uh, and we've also looked at providing iterative feedback on the emerging policy base. Um, we've provided policy uh, wording and text um, suggestions to improve the policy base, and ultimately we'll be in trying to incorporate mitigation and monitoring into the draft plan. Um, in terms of the alternatives, it's very much around um, the EPA uh, framework for developing alternatives. They have very good guidance now, which has come out of one of those effectiveness studies, um, where we look at things, but they have to be reasonable, realistic, viable and implementable. They're the four criteria that go with developing up alternatives. So just as an example, some of the alternatives uh, that we've spoken to the department about over the course of the marine uh, planning framework development are around um, the use of a policy-based approach versus a, um, a spatially-based approach, what that would look like. Prioritization of different aspects, whether it's biodiversity or climate, and then the different policy responses, whether they're criteria-based supporting policies. So these are the kinds of areas that we've been able to talk about. We've also uh, talked about the types of governance alternatives that might exist, and, and that's come out in terms of the positives that are coming out of the plan.
Um, one thing that, that helps us a lot in SCA is around GIS, and certainly GIS has been um, something that the EPA have tried to push uh, a lot for, for supporting SEA. And I just have a few maps to finish off here in terms of the um, how it can help. So uh, the GIS, this is just, I suppose, information maps that allow us to uh, see where the constraints and opportunities might be. The one on the left um, relates to biodiversity. The one on the right is shipping channels. So it starts to build a picture of the constraints. This one we've just drawn up to look at the, the issue of competing interests. So in this one, we've got aggregates in pink along with wind energy, license and leasehold areas um, and fishing activity. And that gives us a good picture of where you're having these uh, combined uh, pressures on an area. Um, this one is around heat zoning and uh, heat mapping and zoning. Um, and this is something that maybe could be used going forward in terms of the strategic development zone approach that has been spoken um, um, of earlier on in terms of informing that kind of uh, zoning if it's needed in certain areas. Um, there's, I'll, I'll just skip to the end now because I'm out of time. So um, just to finish up and sum up how we intend to, I suppose, continue to support the department in the marine planning framework is we will continue to work with them in terms of uh, suggesting policies to them, suggesting policy wording, um, developing mitigation measures uh, for them to include in the plan and also working with them as the consultation rolls out to try and make sure that we embed the stakeholder uh, feedback from the consultation period into the, the overall uh, plan and make it as robust and sustainable as possible. Okay, that's me. Great.